Hello, my name is Peter Cameron and I'm the, um, the Cooperative Development Manager for the Ontario Cooperative Association. We are the Umbrella Trade Association of English-speaking cooperatives and credit unions in Ontario. Our members include agricultural co-ops, housing cooperatives, car sharing co-ops, renewable energy co-ops, food, finance and credit unions, retail co-ops and childcare co-ops. I would like to thank the Rural Ontario Institute for this opportunity to share the cooperative business model with the rural community. The aging baby boomer demographic is affecting all aspects of Ontario society, but will have a particular significant impact on life in rural community as aging business owners look to retire. Small business exits will create a loss of jobs, services and tax base. The traditional ways of passing the business on to family members or selling to another owner are not always possible or successful. Selling to employees utilizing the cooperative business model is an internationally proven successful model, but it is not well known in Ontario and consequently not utilized as much as it could be. This webinar will describe how the co-op model works and provide examples how it has been utilized to successfully save vital community jobs and services. So why do we care about succession planning? As you can see, one in three Canadians are baby boomers, born between 1946 and 1965, almost 9.6 6 million. 310,000 of the current small business owners will want to exit by 2018, and this rises to almost 50% by 2020, or 550,000 owners, business owners, Canada-wide. In Ontario, um, the number of rural businesses that are undergoing succession is somewhere in the neighborhood of over 100,000. There are 232,000 uh, rural businesses as of a 2016 survey, and 48% approximately will be looking to retire in the next five years. Of the 48% who are planning to exit in the next five years, um, about 38% uh, say it'll be one to five years, 29% uh, percent say it'll be 6 to 10 years, and then the rest afterwards. It, it's, uh, it's not looking great. Um, they, when you look at their actual intentions, 23% um, think they will close on retirement, 20% think they will sell to a third party, 18% they'll pass it on to their family, and only 12% might sell to their employees. 27% are not sure what they will do. Why utilize the cooperative business model to sell to the employees? It's a very resilient business model. Twice, it is twice as likely that companies will survive past five years. Development and retention of skilled and diverse workforce, and it contributes to the collective entrepreneurial spirit. All entrepreneurial programs promote that when people own a piece of the pie, they are more likely to work harder and feel more engaged in their business. Cooperatives are a different kind of business model. They focus on people, planet, and profit. Traditional business has a single bottom line, and it is meant to serve the shareholders. Cooperative businesses have a triple bottom line and are concerned with people and the planet as well as making money. What is a cooperative? Here's the official definition. Basically, it's, a, it's about people working together democratically to make a product or service for their members. All co-ops worldwide are based on seven international principles. Voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, member economic participation, autonomy and independence, education, training and information sharing, cooperation amongst cooperatives, and concern for community. We like to say there is a co-op for any product or service that you can think of. The seven principles are aligned with the values of today's consumers. Employees want to be proud of their organization's work, and next era leaders appreciate their companies must contribute to society. For many societal problems, the gig economy, threatened middle class, access to health care and local food, there is a cooperative solution. What is the cooperative difference? Its purpose, fundamentally, is to service the members and in a shareholder corporation it is to service the shareholders and maximize the shareholder profit. The ownership is uh, by the members and we like to say you know members vote not shares. 
and the profits remain with the cooperative to build the business and to expand and improve the service to the members or the community where the profits in a shareholder corporation uh, go to uh, dividends or uh, leave the community to sponsor whatever the shareholders want. The decision making is, is democratic in a, in a co-op, one member, one vote, and again in a, a shareholder corporation shares vote. The Quebec government has done a lot of work to promote the cooperative model. And they asked the obvious question was, well, what's their return on investment? How successful has it been? They've done two long-term studies to show that after one, five, and ten years, the survival rate of cooperatives in all categories is double that of shareholder corporations. Why is that? Well, I mean, I, I will get into it in more detail later, but basically is that if people own a piece of the pie, they're going to work a little harder to make it successful as workers, or if it's community-owned, they're going to patronize it. What is the history of co-ops? Where did they come from? Co-ops have a long and storied history, but they trace the beginning of the movement to Rochdale, England in 1844 and the founding of a, a consumer cooperative. It was the Industrial Revolution. It was a time of great upheaval and people were suffering very poor living conditions and economic inequality. They were demanding the vote and better working conditions. They created their own democracy and economic independence by starting their own store. One of the secrets of their success was that the store did not accept debt because they did not want to force a neighbor to pay a debt they could not uh, uh, handle. But the more you purchased, the more patronage you received at the end. They also wanted to create a library and educate their members, and they wanted to build houses for their members. Setting up their own store was not exactly easy, because initially no supplier in the town would sell to them. They had to go 10 miles to Manchester Market and bought basics like flour, oatmeal, butter, sugar, and candles. When they returned, they had to use some of the candles to light their store because the local gas dealer would not sell them gas, again, afraid of repercussions from the local elites. However, they persisted, and with the support of these members, they succeeded, and within 10 years, there were hundreds of similar retail co-ops all over England. In Ontario, uh, we've recently uh, done a survey uh, and looked at some of the metrics around our performance. Here are some of the key, uh, key findings. Um, we're hoping to have this updated, but there's a lot of this information is from a 2016 uh, study. And you can see that uh, one of the oldest co-ops is Vineland Growers, uh, which was started uh, back in 1913. On a financial basis, um, co-ops contribute over $6 billion to Ontario's uh, gross domestic product. It supports 57,000 jobs. It adds 3.3 billion in wages and dividends to household income, and they pay more than 1.3 billion in taxes. As you know, co-ops, just like any corporation, pay taxes. Here is a breakdown of the size of the sector based on revenue. The largest number of co-ops is actually in the housing sector. The other thing to keep in mind is that co-ops are international. Um, there are over a billion members worldwide, and uh, the International Cooperative Alliance has actually 292 different member organizations based in 95 countries. Here are some local examples of co-ops, and you might recognize some of the names. Cooperators Insurance, Scaly Dairy, Mountain Equipment Co-op. There are all kinds. Here's some more. As I mentioned, Vineland, Howe Co-ops, St. Albert's Cheese, La Siembra Chocolate, Co-op Cabs. And of course, if you're a fan of good brew, uh, there are a couple of new um, beer brewing co-ops, London Brewing Co-op, and one in Kitchener called Together We're Bitter. The types of cooperatives. There are financial cooperatives, surface cooperatives, housing cooperatives, producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, worker cooperatives, multi-stakeholder co-ops. Again, there is one for every need for service uh, or product that you can think of. Here is the basic structure of a co-op. 
Um, this is a consumer co-op. People might be familiar with Mountain Equipment Co-op. It, it, the members elect the board. The board um, makes the, uh, you know, d- uh, the various bylaws and processes and policy statements and hires the staff, and they implement the actual uh, need or service of the, pro- of the, of the co-op. This is an example of a producer co-op. Gailey Dairy has over 1,200 farmers. Uh, rather than just sell their milk to an individual uh, other corporation, they've decided to vertically integrate like any good corporation, but the benefits go back to them. So they make cheese, whipped cream, all kinds of other products, butter. And that way the members benefit from uh, the value add along the chain. The worker cooperative model is very interesting and very applicable to rural uh, enterprises because, again, when you're talking about selling to the employees, um, the the actual uh, members, the, the one of the criteria is that they work at the actual business. Um, they, you know, wear two hats in essence. That they're and when they're when they're employees, um, they're. Uh, working along with any uh, of their management responsibilities of any worker or management person. But when they are acting as members, they're the ones who vote for the board of directors and again implement the, set the policy is then implemented by the workers. The last model is a multi-stakeholder model. And as its name implies, it is a, um, a combination of um, cons- uh, of different stakeholders. Um, A good example is the West End Food Co-op. They have uh, consumer members, they call them eaters, and they have uh, farmer members, producers, they have investors, and they also have people who work in the store. The workers want the highest wages, the consumers want the lowest prices, the farmers want the highest prices for uh, for their goods, and investors want a good return. So to be successful, it has to be a win, win, win model. And it actually is a very, very strong model when it it is established. It's harder to get going initially, but when it gets going, it is very strong. Two cooperative corporation alternatives for business succession. There really are, there are not enough examples yet, but I have a few that I will pass on to. There, the the two potential models, selling to the employees uh, in the form of a worker employee owned co-op, and selling to people in the community who want to keep the products or services available. The first example is a, is a group called CareForce from Nova Scotia. It was owned um, by an individual who wanted to retire. It was mainly women employees. They, they did uh, personal support workers and nurses. And they, uh, with the support of him and local uh, Canadian Worker Co-op Federation business developer, helped transition the business. And now uh, they're doing very well. They've grown from 20 to 55 employees. Average uh, hourly wage has increased by 18%. And they uh, employee uh, retention is so, uh, so much better. Uh, unfortunately, this type of uh, uh, business traditionally has been lower paid. They've done very well, as, as I pointed out. An example of a community-owned or consumer co-op is the Aaron Theatre in Campbellford in rural Ontario. It's got a population of just over 3,000. The local theatre, the Aaron, was, the owner was going to retire. It meant that people would have ended up driving over 45 minutes to the local cinema. And, um, you know, it could have basically been a boarded-up fire trap on the main street. The theatre would have deteriorated. So the local people got together and they said, we want to keep this. Uh, One of the catches, of course, was that Hollywood was going digital, that um, that was one of the big costs that was a deterrent to the owner and the community. uh, What they did was they they got together and they said, we'll sell local community bonds and we will finance the transition from uh, film to digital. And they were very successful in getting a, a community foundation grant and support from the Trillium Foundation to help in, in uh, making the transition. A lot of volunteer help really sort of brought the community together. Um, they even fixed up their uh, uh, local marquee and uh, they now run first run films. They, they have uh, community events, they have speaking and uh, musical events. It really has become a, 
a cultural hub in this small community. Another example is in Kincardine, Ontario. There was a, a popular uh, women's fitness center called Curves. It was closing and the local women uh, users, they wanted to keep this important health and community service alive and so they joined together to form a consumer co-op. They opened in um, September of 2015. There's now 60 to 70 members. Um, they charge $50 a month. They have some volunteer shift opportunities. Uh, it's open 24-7. And um, they, were, they were fortunate to get the equipment from the old curse. And now it's a, a very successful business. And interesting enough, they um, a group in Fergus, Ontario, uh, heard about the success of the Concordon Co-op and they got in touch with them because it was a similar situation with a, a Curves franchise uh, closing. And the Concordon people sent um, all their policies and bylaws and incorporation documents and made it so much easier for this uh, Fergus group to uh, form. And, and now it is uh, opened um, just last year and it is a great success also. In northern Ontario, uh, there's a little town uh, called Moonbeam. And you can see from the map here, it's uh, quite a little drive from um, that particular location to any of the closest other towns uh, that, that offered uh, grocery shopping. The one store in Moonbeam uh, had a retiring owner and it was going to close. There was no, there was no uh, person stepping up to, to purchase it. And the local community uh, people said, no, we, we need this service. We don't want to drive uh, quite a distance, especially in winter, to get your standard uh, bread and milk. And um, uh, we can come together and we can um, own the store ourselves. And they, they did a fantastic job of raising capital and um, they uh, purchased the store from the, the original owner and they fixed it up and now it, again it is a, an excellent success of a rural community coming together to form a, a community co-op and uh, provide good service that is needed for the community. So what is the process for conversion? Well, it's very similar to any particular business, uh, setting up a business or converting a private business. It's really based on the level of interest of the employees and the community. Um, you know, you, you have to uh, get a commitment from everyone. You have to identify, um, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of the particular people and the, the state of the business. It's always better, of course, to catch a business before it starts to slide. Uh, uh, the owner is identified early. Uh, the situation for uh, succession is identified early. That's so much better. In fact, a three to five year period is probably the best. Um, and to get everything in a row to um, provide a smooth transition. So yes, you do the assessment, the planning, the business valuation, purchase agreement, all standard stuff in terms of, you know, developing a business plan and your bylaws and then moving to incorporation and then uh, doing the appropriate training and the uh, handover once the capital is raised and, and the agreement is, is in place, then you actually, there is a, there is a time of, of, of really a cultural change. And it's so important, if you can, to have the original owner involved in that, either you know, through a short-term contract of, of um, hiring the person back to provide that corporate memory and uh, uh, all the little things that aren't usually documented uh, to be successful in the transition. And um, another point is, for many owners who don't want to, um, dare I say, go cold turkey, um, because they, they started the business, they felt that they, you know, this is a bit of a legacy, that they wanted to make sure that that business succeeded and that they, uh, you know, the, the service they provided to the community and to the employees carried on. So if they actually set up a, a new cooperative, the, the, the cooperative would buy out the old business and the old business owner, but the business owner could become part of the new entity and therefore, as I said, pass on that information, but also set an exit strategy for themselves, you know, be it uh, one year or two years. The, the benefits, obviously, again, to the, to the co-op are the, the, the corporate knowledge being passed on, but also for the, for the owner um, in terms of a, 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 a very um, um, a 
appropriate exit strategy for them. Some of the basics for starting up a co-op. You need five in Ontario. You need five people to start a consumer co-op or a producer co-op. You only need three for a worker cooperative. Um, right now, the Articles of Incorporation go to Fiscal, the Financial Services Commission of Ontario. Uh, we're actually hoping to have that changed uh, very soon. Uh, we, we hope to be under Ministry of Government Services, it's similar to, to um, shareholder corporations and to nonprofit corporations. And, um, you know, some of the details in terms of uh, raising capital, um, uh, some of the share structure are, are, are unique to cooperatives. And in fact, there are some benefits in the sense of raising capital. You can use something called an offering statement, which um, is, is a little less onerous than and going to the Securities Commission and a prospectus. Um, co-op legislation, it is the Ontario Cooperative Corporations Act, uh, the credit union uh, and Case Populaire Separate Act. Uh, if you wanted to incorporate federally, uh, you you have to be operating and have offices in uh, two or more uh, provinces to, to incorporate under the federal act. And there are, it's true, there are some unofficial co-ops, uh, collectives, co-op-like organizations that are out there. Social enterprise, it's interesting that the um, all the talk about social enterprise now, uh, which is doing business for good, is fantastic. Um, but actually, there is no model, uh, corporate legal model, called a social enterprise. But the cooperative model, with its um, triple bottom line approach, really is the model that most cooperative uh, social enterprises should embrace because it does have those values. And in fact, those values, as I, as I noted earlier, have been inherent in the model since 1844. This is uh, just a quick description of FISCO, Financial Services Commission of Ontario. And here's some great sites uh, to have some follow-up information, uh, Co-op Zone, um, and of course our, our co-op Ontario.coop. We have an upper level domain, you might have noticed, just for co-ops. And uh, that's fantastic in terms of helping us to you know share our brand and become better known. And um, I think in summary for now, um, I, I uh, would like to say that uh, the whole retiring issue of, of boomers, and I'm one of them, is it's upon us. We're in the midst of it now, and the impact is going to be huge. Um, one of the, you know, the alternatives that I think should be embraced by uh, rural communities and, and individuals is the cooperative model. It has those benefits of the triple bottom line. And um, we at the Ontario Cooperative Association are here to help if anyone is interested. And uh, I thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Peter Cameron, and I'm the. I'm